the plague made them go crazy, guys. Like, look at the foot. This they wore this shit. And Christians have the fucking chutzpah to make fun of Muslims for hijabs. What the fuck is that? Okay, yeah, this is the original cat girl, 14th century style. Okay, we are going to move on to another spicy, spicy topic. We're gonna talk about hijabs, not just hijabs. We're gonna talk about like women's hair, hair coverings, the history of it. It's actually way more interesting than you think, by the way. If you think this is gonna be boring, just stay for 20 minutes, test it out. You just okay, then you can leave, all right? Otherwise, I'm, I'm hooking you in. You're not allowed to leave right now. So I'm sure you guys, have you guys ever seen this? This hair covering, it's called a hijab. There's lots of different types of hair coverings. I'm sure what you've seen uh, uh, Iman wear, like she wears something a little different. And you might have also seen something like this, right? Or uh, Jewish women wearing wigs, kind of like that. So both in Orthodox Judaism, right? Both in, actually, I shouldn't even say Orthodox Ju Judaism because in, Ju in Judaism in general, right? Um, married women need to cover their hair. Now, the extent of how much they cover their hair and how they cover their hair is dependent on how religious you are. Like how, if you're Orthodox, if you're Reform, all that kind of stuff. So Jewish women um, cover their hair um, uh, when they get married. And Muslim women cover their hair, I think, at starting at the age of nine, from my understanding. And they cover their hair for pretty much the same reasons. I mean, there's some like little details here and there that are different, but it's similar. So there are religious reasons for this, but they're primarily, but there's also cultural reasons. Now, they kind of intersect in weird ways, right? Because, um, of course, a lot of things that we find, a lot of aspects of Jewish culture are actually, like, when people think are religious, they're actually much more cultural. Um, and it's the exact same thing with Islam. And I know this is crazy. It's the same thing with Christianity. Yes, there is such a thing as Christian culture. I know it's super weird. We're living in it right now. Yes. I know, even, like, even if you're not Christian, right? Um, okay, I shouldn't say everyone, right? Because there are some people who are in Syria, right? But if you are in a country that has been historically Christian, you're in a Christian country, even if it's not. Like, if you're in Britain or Canada, you're literally in a Christian country since it's, like, our religion by law. If you're in America, it's still a Christian country, just, like, not as literally because of, you know, the remnants of culture. It's, like, it's a, it's a Western culture, right? And the way we dress and stuff is all comes down, comes back from Christian culture. A lot of people, so people have asked me this before, right? And actually one of my friends asked me recently. And they were like, why do we see like the majority of Muslim, like majority of religious Muslim women cover their hair? Um, and the majority of Jewish women who are like observing cover their hair. So why do the majority of religious Christian people don't cover their hair? There are some very minor sects that do, but it's very minor. Now the reason is actually really, really, fascinating because the truth is is that women christian women did cover their hair and in fact they covered their hair for a really really long period of time so let's look at this classic women hair covering i'm pretty sure that's from the 13th century so the reason why jewish women and muslim women cover their hair is the exact same reason that christian women used to cover their hair which is that there is a portion of the bibles i'm pretty sure it's in numbers and it's in the old testament for jews um and uh um, sorry, it's in the Old Testament for Christians and Muslims. It's in the Torah for the Jews. Um, and there is a description of a woman, right, who has just been caught for adultery. Really bad, guys, okay? You know, woman sleeping with other people when married. It's nasty, terrible, horrible. You're worse than a human being, worse than a pedophile, the worst person in the world, according to the Bible. Yeah, they're, yeah, the worst type. In, in the Bible, like, they think there's nothing worse than a woman who cheats on her husband. Like, literally, the scum of the earth, okay? The scum of the earth, according to the Bible. And in the passage, they drag her to the center of the square. And they pull off her hair covering to show the world her shame. Those are the words, exactly. So, because of that, if, like, a woman's hair covering was pulled off as a consequence of her being caught for adultery and to show the world her shame. What's the implication there? The implication is that women who don't commit adultery should cover their hair, like a good woman. So the reasons why, like the historical reasons why this is the case is exactly for what Only Facts was saying, was that it was just very common in the Levant and in the area for women um, to cover their hair, right? It was probably to protect it, like, 
Um, there's probably a billion reasons. Fashion purposes. I like there's so many reasons, right? Just the region is probably common. Um, and maybe they pulled off her hairdressing. Um, and maybe they pulled off other things about her, right? Like they physically shamed her, like the way they did in, I don't know, to Cersei Lannister in Game of Thrones. Um, a bunch of, I mean, I feel very bad for this woman. It's probably really shitty. But that passage itself is what really leads to Judaism and the core of Judaism, focusing so much that if you are a woman and you have not committed adultery, so you are a good woman, a pious woman, a religious woman, a woman that is modest, your hair is going to be covered. Now, Islam ends up starting to do the same thing. Now, to my knowledge, there's no part in the Hadith that dictates that a woman has to cover her hair with something like a hijab, right? But again, it's it becomes so common in the Levant, in the area, that this just becomes like a cultural like commonality. And that's why in different cultures in Islam, you'll see like different types of hair, hair coverings. So the same thing actually was with Christianity. And this is something that I find absolutely wild when I see um, people that are Christian, religiously Christian, and they insult like Muslim women for wearing hijabs or they say that they're like, or they say that it's like somehow like unfeminist or I don't know, shit like that. And I'm like, you're just, it sounds so hypocritical. <laughs> like it just sounds, because Christian women used to do it until very recently. And so I was going to talk about why women, why Christian women, um, and why it became the norm for, uh, our society and for Western society to not be wearing hair coverings, right? And why that became a cultural norm. So um, this picture, this demonstration, I'm pretty sure this is from the 12th century. It was really, really common. Originally when women had um, hair coverings, right? Um, initially when women had hair coverings, it was basically like they would wear kind of this like kind of cough, like almost like a scarf. Um, it almost all looks very similar to a modern hijab, right? That would just cover up all aspects of the hair. And this is kind of like a fence law, like just to keep yourself from just in case any strand of hair coming out. And then they have a more fashionable like veil to go over it, right? It's very, very common. I forget the exact term. So in Judaism, the way I was taught was that the reason why um, you cover your hair as, and I, I'm interested to hear from any of the Muslim women in chat or Muslims just who know more about um, about the perspective of why they're taught today. Um, the I'm taught that the reason why a woman covers her hair, I mean, there's the legal reason that I explained, um, but it's also, it's about modesty. It's about the idea that your hair is the most sexual part of you, the most attractive part of you. And um, that's only for your husband. It's like a holy part of you. So you should only show that to your husband privately. Um, and so that's kind of like the way they justify it. The way I've heard feminists argue, and I think, and I can understand their argument, um, is that it's a way for the husband to own the beauty. It's a part of, you know, the um, mar marriage being like a um, patriarchal system. And so, and this is why, like, in the, in the marriage ceremony, right before the marriage ceremony begins, the Jewish man covers the Jewish wife with the veil in front of her face. Um, it's a big ceremony. I'm not sure. I have no clue if they do the same thing in Islam. Um, and so a feminist will argue, right, that, um, that when he covers her hair, right, he will say um, he is taking her beauty and owning her beauty for himself. Um, and it's a patriarchal thing. And it's about ownership. So. Anyways, that's the extent of that. Now, there were a lot of very similar reasons that were used originally um, in uh, um, historically for women at, uh, during Christian women during the medieval period. So we know that, for example, Christianity starts taking hold in Rome. And of course, they start taking on a bunch of like the uh, cultural attitudes of Jews, right? Um, and one of those cultural attitudes, right, was women covering their hair um, and modesty. And modesty seemed being like a huge value to really um, to really connect you. Now, if you look at this, you're probably thinking, wait, I haven't, when I see medieval movies, right, when I see medieval movies, I don't normally see them with hair coverings, right? Like, what's a what's an image of like a medieval movie that normally people would see? I think usually when people imagine medieval hair, they're thinking something like that, something like this, maybe something like this, right? 
Now, this actually only starts in the 15th century with the Renaissance. This starts in Italy. That's when it becomes really popular. So our image of medieval hair being like these like braids and you see like all that kind of stuff. None of that's historically accurate. Okay. Not true. Okay. It's a lie. I don't know why movies do this. It's probably because they just want to show people's cool hair or something like that. But um, the belief that women had their hair like this during the medieval period is actually called medievalism. It's an entire study itself um, of like our society and how we think the medieval period was, which um, is not a th uh, isn't actually true. Were head monarch queens also expected to cover their hair in medieval Europe? Yes. Oh, even more so. Even more so. Now, it come it does come medievalism does come from the Victorian age because the Victorians were obsessed with medieval culture. They like worship medieval culture. You know, the way kind of like right now everyone's like really obsessed with Y2K or like the 70s. Like the Victorians are like, oh, it was so much better back in the day. Don't you remember the plague? We loved it. Quite, quite, lo quite lovely, wasn't it? But yeah, even movies like Braveheart, they show like medieval, like, I just look at this. No, none, they didn't look like that at all. Okay. This is actually much more close. This is, this is not so bad. Okay. This is very, no, <laughs> they never faded themselves. Anyways. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to get into male fashion. So <laughs> women had like these hair coverings um, and it, they usually had two parts and it was really important to cover their hair um, from the moment that they were uh, very similar rules to Islam. Now, depending on culture, right, there will often be like different depending on like the various culture or whatever, there will be like different types of hair coverings. Like um, you'll obviously see different hair coverings in like France compared to Germany, compared to, um, you know, Russia, etc. Um, I'm pretty sure this is more of a German style, but most at the time, um, the, especially during the, uh, the late medieval period, right? Power goes from being in Francia down South towards being in Italy. And so the fashion really starts, starts in Italy, right? And this is like, you know, guys, Renaissance period, end of the 15th century. And up to then it was totally, everyone covered their hair. Like it was just a woman, you would never be caught outside, like out of your house, not covering her hair. It's like the scandal. If some if someone shows their hair, it's like that fucking whore. Okay, that little fucking slut. She showed her hair. They even had like wild hair coverings. Okay, you want to see one of the craziest hair coverings they have? They had like horns for a while in the 14th century. I don't know. Maybe the plague made them go crazy. 14th century, the plague is when it really hit. The plague made them go crazy, guys. Like, look at the fuck this. They wore this shit. Okay. And Christians have the fucking chutzpah to make fun of Muslims for hijabs. What the fuck is that? Sometimes they'd wear like, you know, that image of like a almost like a, a triangle hat that like reaches for the sky with like a, they wore shit like that. It was crazy. OK, yeah, this is the original cat girl, the original cat girl. OK, 14th century style, lost her family to the plague. But she still came out looking beautiful. All right. Meow. I can't believe I just said that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, now what's happening? So this is 14th century. Now, what happens in the 1400s? There's this new wave going on, this crazy new thing. There's this new fashion. Have you heard of the new, you know, have you heard of like, you know, Michelangelo and Leonardo and like in the late 15th century, in the late like 1400s, like this is what the Renaissance starts, right? Now, a lot of historians debate whether or not it's really Renaissance, blah, 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 because the Renaissance really happens in different areas. I'm not going to get into the details, right? But regardless, a Renaissance starts in Italy, okay? Um, people are bringing, over, they're bringing older fashions. They're bringing all these old texts. You know, they regard the past as a dark age, even though it wasn't really. They're bringing all these old texts back from the ancient times. Um, they're focusing on mathematics and design and art and you know, and literature, and suddenly they become educated, and all these grand, you know, pretentious things. All the things that we love, right? We're talking Ninja Turtles, yes, exactly. So they really feel like they've kind of m moved on from that time period. And why does she have two peepees on her? Okay. Why are you guys making weird ass comments? So they, so they decide that by the time, um, so like, be, and because of there are all these being innovations being done in science, the printing press gets invented. Um, and the, 
what do you call it? Like there's just, there's so many new innovations, right? There's this idea of like the Renaissance man and the Renaissance woman. Um, and they really, the young people, they think they're in this new age. They think they're super different. They're so much better than the oldies, okay? And so they start doing all some scandalous things, right? They start saying, okay, like, we're still going to cover our hair, of course, because we're not fucking skanks. Like, who do you take us for? But maybe we'll play it a little, a little dangerously. That fucking whore. Okay, I'm kidding. So um, this is a specific kind of type of cap. It becomes popular. Um, it becomes pretty popular in, uh, in Italy and in Germany, spreads to Germany. Um, and it's where they're, they kind of wear hair net. And so they're covering the hair, but they're still like showing little pokes in it, like little parts, little parts. They're still covering the face. So it still feels somewhat modest, but it's not. And it's very scandalous. What a, what a, what a whore. Okay. And then in France, a fascinating new style starts because France is like the epitome of like, oh no, we are going to do our own fashion. Okay. Because you're just so backwards and we are a culture because we are French. And so in France, all right, we're talking late 1400s, early, early 1500s here, right? In France, they start do, wearing this thing that the special hood. Um, now, it kind of looks like that's her hair at the back, but that's not. She's actually, it's a black veil, if you can see kind of at the back, right? And at the top, it's almost like a crown that forms. It's actually later inspires what we see as modern tiaras. You know, like the tiaras that you see on a Princess Diana or something? That shape, that shape actually goes back to that. I know, isn't that cool? In some ways, it's more modest than the previous look, right? Because there's no holes in the back, right? It's still fully covering the hair, but it gives this illusion. Because it's like this dark black veil, it almost gives this illusion of having long, sultry black back hair, like black hair at the back. And then at the front, it just shows maybe like a tiny bit of a hair, just a tiny bit, right? Some women would, would still wear a cough like completely under, so it wouldn't show any if they wanted to be like really, um, you know, really modest. But for most people, this was like this was still somewhat somewhat socially acceptable. But it's still scandalous. Like the equivalent of walking around like this, right, in any court but France, is like the equivalent modern day of like I don't know, like a woman walking around with like like shorts that show like the bottom of her ass crack. Okay, like people would be like, like you can you can get away with it. But people are going to be like, oh, man, she's really showing a lot of skin there, right? So this is what they're going to be saying at the time. This style becomes really popular with the young women in France. Now, at the time, right, another style starts being popular, right? For the more pious woman, the more woman, she's not as worldly, but she's more feminine and she's more chaste, much more wifely material, you see. So this is another style that starts being popular. This is more of a gable hood. It's because it kind of forms like a gable. It's like got three points, just like a church with like, just like the cross with like the three points of the, the cross. So it's, it's very, it's very um, pious. So the pious, virginly good woman would wear this, right? It, it's very ironic, right? Because of course the woman on the right, she was a, you know, she had lots and lots of sex and was known to be incredibly sexy, but it's fine. It's fine. We're not gonna, we're not gonna call her a hypocrite or anything. That would be fucked up. Her eyebrows run into her nose in such a serious line. Yeah. So, the woman on the left um, is no is her name is Margaret Tudor. Okay, very very pious woman. Um, she had one child at fourteen years old, or, or no, at twelve years old, and was barren ever since. Almost like twelve year olds shouldn't shouldn't have sex. And um, and on the right is Elizabeth of York, right? Her marriage ended up ending the, the War of the Roses. Very, very, very famous woman. Um, she's the mother of Henry VIII, you know? My Henry. So now the gable, right, could be weared, wore, it could be worn without like a kind of cough underneath that's like super modest, or it can be worn like just showing a little bit of the front hair. Just, just a little poke, just to remind you that you're not that old. Just a little peek, just a little peekaboo. Okay. And when, and you know, so basically like these are the, this is the classic Madonna whore complex. Okay. So, so she's the Madonna. Wait, where's the whore? Oh, there. She's the whore. So 
that was kind of like the primary styles that people would have. I'll give you another example of like that kind of style here. Actually, now we're starting to get more into like the 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 like the middle of like the the 1530s, etc. Right now, this is another type of that that covering. So it's got a bit of a veil. It's almost like a hybrid. It's got a bit of a veil at the back, and then still got like those three corners. Right, it's still considered much more modest than this and the scandalous like French hood. It's so French, it's gross. So here we've got like able, and then this is a very, very modest because she's not trying to make it look like her hair at the back. It's not like this long veil. Like this is very modest, right? Like this woman was considered very much the epitome of English piety, right? She's not wearing those scandalous French fashions. Like that would be horrible, Ugh. right? But what's interesting, right? You compare that. What I find so interesting is you compare how someone like her is portrayed, right? Whereas like in movies, right? In movies, this is how she's portrayed. Like what the fuck? Like what? She's showing her hair. Like that's like the equivalent of walking around naked. No. Why? But you see, you can kind of start to see the remnants of like how it starts they start to show. Now, actually, some Jewish women to this day actually do show parts of the front of their hair, and it's considered okay. Um, some Christian women, uh, very minor, like cover a little bit part of their hair, um, but they show like the majority of it. Um, some Muslim women do the same thing. So it's very, it debate. there's a big debate on how much you do. Now, probably wondering, how do we go from there from like no hair covering? As we enter the kind of late, Tudor period. So we're getting from the early, um, the early 1510s, 1520s, right? The, and we're getting into like 1530s, 1540s. Here, I'll show you. So this is a young Queen Elizabeth. Um, she's got the veil. You can't really see that much, but she's got the veil. She's wearing that French hood. She's wearing that scandalous French hood. And if you noticed, it's even more scandalous. Then the first one, she's actually showing even more hair. It's becoming so much more normalized, right, over time to show that front part of the hair. In fact, by the time, like, she's in her teenage years, it's not weird at all to show that front part. As long as you're covering her hair somehow, right? As long as you're covering most of it. But yeah, you can kind of just see here how much hair she's really showing. Lots of hair in the front. You wouldn't have seen that in the earlier French hoods that are only going to show, like, a tiny, tiny part. Now, what's happened in the 16th century? So something crazy happened in the 13th, in the, in the 15th century, right? Um, well, I guess it technically was in the late 15th century, right? Um, in 1492, uh, Columbus lands in the Americas. And by the 16th century, the Americas are being full colonized. Something that fa happens around this period, and this is why a lot of historians think that maybe um, uh, syphilis, because of course there was an exchange of diseases and it, the, and you know, um, the disease the Europeans gave was smallpox, which is definitely was a shorter end of the stick for the indigenous people of the Americas, right? And the disease that they brought back, now, this is a theory. We don't know for sure. There's a lot of, like, mixed opinions. There's a lot of debate about this. Um, but the theory is that um, uh, the European colonizers brought back syphilis, right? And because they didn't have any, like, antibodies and stuff to resist it, syphilis, like, tore through um, uh, anyone that was very sexually active. So syphilis starts hitting the courts of England, France, uh, Italy, Spain, right? And it just ravages these courts, right? Because God, like the men, they went in, they had lots of sex, they came back. Evidence suggests Columbus and his crew not only introduced the old world to the new world, um, but brought back syphilis as well. Yes. Yeah, they didn't have immunity. So syphilis just like ravages them. Now, if you don't know what syphilis is, okay, I'm not going to look up the images because it's not. That's definitely going to break TOS, okay? Um, but syphilis causes these, it's an, S, it's an STI, right? Or at the time, they would call it a venereal disease, right? Um, a disease of the loins, as one would say. Uh, people at the time, this is before Victorian Latin value, so people were very promiscuous as one would say, and it, and it just becomes, like, so ubiquitous that so many people get it, um, in, like, including kings and queens, right? Um, now, Elizabeth, uh, 
gets that. And she also had smallpox. So um, a lot of people think Henry VIII actually had it too. And one of the things, it causes like these lesions, right? And smallpox also becomes like very ubiquitous. Um, and so people lose, they get like alopecia, which is like you lose like parts of your hair. You create like bald spots. Um, and so it started to become common that people would wear wigs. Wigs start being really, really big, right? Now, uh, I'll give you an example of a wig. Now, this is Queen Elizabeth in a wig. Now, if you notice, she's not wearing a hair covering. I mean, she's wearing kind of like a crown, like some decor, but it's not really a hair covering. Now, anyone can, anyone figure out the logic behind this? It's very similar, very, very similar to modern Jewish logic on, on Jewish women wearing wigs instead of covering their hair. It's not accepted by Islam, probably because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. It's not her actual hair. So she is still wearing the head covering, right? In reality, the head covering is the wig. And it's obviously a wig. I mean, we could, I mean, it looks like a wig. Right? So it's not that big of a deal. It's just, it's a hair covering. So at least it's still, she's still not being super scandalous. It's not mine, so it's fine. Exactly. Exactly. So that was kind of like the logic behind that. Now, this begins the age, okay, some people call it, some people call it, you know, the, the Elizabethan age, some people call it, okay, you know, the, um, the golden age, I call it the age of wigs, okay, and now the age of wigs actually lasts up until the late 18th century, and wigs, so people still, so wigs become so ubiquitous that even women who haven't lost their hair, even women who have great, they have nice fine hair, they start wearing wigs too because it's like they become like a, because wigs are really, really expensive. So they become almost like a status symbol um, for uh, high society in, in European Christian culture, right? Like, it's, and because they're, they're expensive, I mean, they're someone else's hair. They're usually real, real hair wigs I mean, and they're a status symbol. Very similar to now. Interesting, right? And so because of that, wigs start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, they become so popular that men start wearing the wigs too. Yeah, this is honestly, it's, a, I, I, look at the, look at their hair. Why don't men dress like this anymore? I feel like men would get laid so much more if they dress like this. Like, oh, look at that handsome chap. What the fuck? Like, look at that. They would also add the mustache that really like, you know, like the typical pirate look, like that's where that comes from. So you really see like how they start like kind of having this really, really long hair. Now, um, what ends up happening, okay, is wigs just get bigger and bigger. Primarily, they get taller. So they go from being somewhat like minuscule, not that intense. And by the next century, because they are, again, such they become such a status symbol, right? That they just get taller and taller and every fashion is just like constant growth. It's literally three heads high. They also started powdering their wigs. Like that's its own story. It's really wild. Yeah, they started powdering their wigs like crazy. Sometimes initially they was just to gray it a little bit, but then they like, yeah. The, the powder was also very useful for making really tall wigs. It was a mix of different types of hair. I'm not sure about the details. But like, I don't know. Nothing said a sexy woman like a three, three heads of hair. Now, what happens at the end of the 18th century is this little known event called the French Revolution. Viva la France! Down with the aristocrats! Down with the aristocracy! We are French! We show the heads of the aristocrats! Freedom! The French Revolution happens, and Marie Antoinette is, who is in this photo, is infamously, or famously, depending on your politics, executed, along with her husband. Yes, Joan of Arc would have worn a hair covering in battle, 100%. She was operating in the 14th century, right? Now, France is incredibly powerful at the time. Like, one of the leaders of Europe. They surpassed Spain. So they're like the fashion leaders of the era. 
And they've just toppled their aristocracy, literally. Okay? So, suddenly, with this new, there becomes a new period of class consciousness. And suddenly being upper class, which is all about what wigs and the hair was about, is not cool anymore. Almost think of it as the equivalent of like the 90s grunge era being a response to the 80s crazy hair. It's almost like that, right? There was like this response where no one wanted to be, no one wanted to be like an upper class aristocrat, right? Those guys got beheaded. Those guys were of the old age. And people wanted to look like middle class, the middle class, the everyman. People wanted to look minimalist, simple. They wanted to go back. Let's go back to the purity of the ancients. Do you remember how they dressed with these long, flowy dresses? Very simple, right? Um, nothing too expensive. If you, because if you if you look too expensive, then you look like an aristocrat, right? Everyone wants to look very minimalist. Even the well and the wealthy especially want to look minimalist because they're like, bro, like we don't have any wealth. I don't know what you're talking about. Please, please don't behead me. Within, and I'm telling you. Within one year, this changes. One year, okay? That's how big of a deal the French Revolution was. It affected fashion this much. Otherwise, it was not a big deal whatsoever, okay? Mm. Kidding. Mm. So fashion goes from this. Like, what the fuck is she wearing on her head? This is an accurate, like, this is literally how people dressed. Okay? In the 18th century. Yes, that is incredibly wide. It's much wider than it is, like, depth-wise. It's just, like, really wide. This way you can like turn to the side to get through doorways. And if you need a poop, don't worry. A woman can just put a bowl under and then, you know, because you got slaves. It's all fine. Yeah, women dress like this. Crazy. So in one year, fashion went like that. And suddenly, for the first time, it became socially acceptable and actually more pious to show your hair as a woman. Now, these women are in theory, are going to be seen as very Christian, very chaste, very virginal, all the things that came with covering your hair. The problem was is that covering your hair started to be seen as such like this like grandiose, excess, aristocratic thing that it stopped being an idea of modesty. I mean, how is that modest? <laughs> like in no world, in no world is this modest. And of course, this looks so much more like modern fashion, right? In fact, we see actually like hemlines and very similar kind of styles to this day in very similar similar ways. But yeah, actually this style, people think it started in the 1800s. It actually started right after the French Revolution. It was very quick. Napoleon area, Regency area, era, etc. And suddenly like this starts really being seen as modest. It all becomes about being minimalist and simple like uh, and that brings you closer to God. That makes you much more pious. And it's really fascinating, right? Because like from this period on, showing your hair really was actually the humble thing to do. And I think Jews and Muslims are looking over and being like, yeah, that makes no sense, bro. But that's because they never, never did this shit. Like, trust me, like Muslim fashion has done crazy cool things, but they never took it this tie, okay? Like, this is something unique to European culture. Yeah, they didn't experience the wigs arm race. And with everything, like, and with fashion, there's always a response. Like, there's something becomes big and there's a response. So minimalism really takes over. Um, now, this later gets replaced in the, around the 1830s, where people start dressing a little more fancy, but they still show, start showing their hair, because now, now showing your hair is considered pious. And what happens in the 19th century? France is no longer as, much, as powerful as they once were. And who steps in to take their place? Both Germany and a little empire called Great Britain. And so fashion really, fashion particularly starts to um, be very important in the English courts. And that's when like the cultural dominance of British culture really, really starts. You can see they kind of like slowly start making things a little more fancy, but they're never going too overboard, okay? It's never too overboard. 
I actually, I hate 1830s hair. Like, they did this, like, middle part, and then they did these, like, side bun things. Like, like what the fuck is that? It's just not flattering. I, it doesn't look at me. All these changes have brought us to the point where Macron is having a hoodie. And it's really, really interesting because you see, like, very similar trends happening today. First of all, what's crazy is, and I would have never guessed this, but wigs have come in style again. Like, wigs are in. In fact, majority of the people that you're seeing in, like, fancy Instagram subscribe, like, pa fancy Instagram influencers and stuff, they're all wearing wigs. Um, and this really starts, and guess who brings it back? It's black women. So black women bring in weaves and they bring in um, other forms of fake hair and different hair and all this stuff. It's a huge part of American black culture. I'm not sure about, I have no clue if it is in other aspects of the world. But, um, and so because that, like wigs start being way more fashion again, and now tons of women are either wearing extensions or they're wearing wigs. Um, like whole wigs itself, it's like, it's so common now. It's crazy. And it's like the first time since the, uh, the 18th century that they're like socially acceptable to be wearing them. I think that's, it's very interesting how that stuff happens. And I wonder if they'll, there will be a response again. You love outrageous fashion? Yeah, no, me too. I love how this shit connects. Um, what I find interesting, and you always see like how much like fashion influences society and society and influences fashion um and i wonder how much the quarantine and the pandemic is going to affect fashion like changing it um because the 2010s were definitely years of excess and they end of course with 2020 which is the pandemic and everyone's so focused everyone wants to be in comfortable wear so things like sweatpants and like the juicy sweatpants from like the early 2000s have come back and everyone's trying to be cozy and comfortable um makeup use which had a huge prominence became huge in the 2010s because of youtube is now selling terribly did you guys know there's like a there's like a cold like a makeup is like dying Right. Yeah. There's this whole new cozy thing. Yeah. Makeups, like makeup sales have gone down like crazy. If I went to, if you go to the Sephora website right now, you're going to notice that they're primarily going to be showing you skincare. Right. And this is why skincare started to takes over because the cosmetic industry needed something else to focus on besides makeup because people are just not wearing makeup anymore. And all these women who initially had like, cause, um, uh, the fe the the makeup industry had kind of co-opted feminism. They were like, oh, you're going to, like, you know, wear makeup for you, right? Like, this is a symbol of what you want, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turned out that women primarily weren't actually wearing makeup for them. Maybe they thought they were. I thought I was. But when the pandemic hit, they weren't wearing makeup anymore. Like, let's be real. <laughs> and... So it's, I find that really, but like skincare has gone way up. It's just really, really cool. Um, yeah, for me, like I was always told kind of by like the feminist movement, um, and I understand why, right? Um, you know, that like women, we wear makeup because we love it and we enjoy it and it's for us. But guess what? Pandemic hit, almost all of us stopped wearing it. And so it was like the ultimate sign, like maybe I wasn't really wearing it for me. Maybe I, that was something that, you know, the makeup industry had convinced me of to sell makeup, which is very common. Capitalism co-opting social justice movements to sell products. Never heard of that one. So I find that it's just, it's fascinating. You still have some Christian cultures, like anyone who was any culture that didn't participate in like the mainstream and had like its own, like, and operated separately, like they're very like insular and stuff, like Amish people, um, Mennonites, etc. Like they still often still wear like caps and stuff. And a lot of people still feel like you have to cover your hair when you enter church. Even to this day, um, British women, upper class women have to wear hats um, when they go to like a, a wedding or something. I'll show you. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck that is either. People wear wacky hats in Britain. Very crazy. But anyways. So that's the conclusion of uh, why, you know, Western women and European women don't cover their hair anymore. <laughs>